Oh, thank you so much, everybody. And uh, so the topic is premature ovarian insufficiency. So you can see that the topic has changed from premature ovarian failure, which Dr. Duru had talked about. Now it, the terminology has changed to premature ovarian insufficiency. And we're going to talk about the recent trends and what advances. But I really would like to have, make a disclaimer over here uh, because uh, the, uh, the disclaimer is because this is a menopause group. And uh, so I would be concentrating on POI in terms of the menopause and its sequelae rather than on the fertility side, because that itself would take another 45 minutes if you go on to the recent advances in the fertility management. So the discussion would be like, the first I'll start off with a take home message, then the terminology, the prevalence of Q cases, diagnosis, sequelae and management. So that's the flow of my thought for today's oration. Yeah, uh, so the take home message is primary ovarian insufficiency is not a physiological condition like menopause, it is a pathological condition. The approach to health maintenance hence would be very distinct from natural menopause. And here it is not MHT, it is HRT, which is an effective first line treatment unless it is contraindicated. And HT is the first line approach because it replaces the levels of estrogen. And here it has to be really personalized because the HRT that is needed for these women would depend upon the age and the time that she is passing through. And here the treatment of postmenopausal low bone mass is very, very effective by hormone therapy. That is the first line of management rather than the other bone therapies that we have. And combine hormonal contraceptives they prevent ovulation and pregnancy more reliably than hormone therapy, HRT, to overcome aberrant ovulation. So here you have an option of CHC vis-a-vis -vis HRT, unlike what you would do in the postmenopause. So the treatment itself is very, very different from POI and uh, menopause. Non-contraceptive estrogen replacement with insertion of polymenorgestrol IU device is an option to oral CHC. So instead of a contraceptive device, instead of taking the oral hormonal pills, we can also insert a device and then get the plain estrogen throughout for these women. So, but there are, of course, we'll go through as the, as the uh, slides progress. Treatment for all women with primary ovarian insufficiency should continue until the average age of natural menopause. Uh, I'm sorry, we should not be saying primary, it is a premature ovarian insufficiency should continue until the average age of natural menopause is reached. That is around 46 to 47 in India. And of course, opt for treatment for fertility is a different scene altogether. So premature insufficiency, what, what, what is the definition? It is a spontaneous menopause occurring two standard deviations below the mean estimated age for the reference population. Traditionally, it is considered to be below the age of 40, 40 years. That is when the menopause is occurring at the age of 52. But in our country, when the average age of menopause from the uh, clinic-based studies that we have, the hospital-based studies that we have, is around 46 to 47, then probably we should start considering as occurring below 30 years. But now there's another terminology which is very, very important, which we should be looking into, is the early menopause. Because we have a lot of women who are not into POI, but they are into early menopause. Now, early menopause is a big thing which is coming up in this field of menopause. It, this is the time span between the spontaneous I iatrogenic menopause occurring between, you're not able to hear? Occurring between the age of 40 years and the accepted typical age of menopause for a given population. So this slide actually is enough to talk about the cause and the, path uh, the, the pathology and its effect. That is accelerated loss of the accelerated loss or a dysfunction of ovarian follicles before the age of 40 in our country, before the age of 38 years. So what does it present as? It presents as menstrual disturbances, elevated gonadotrophins, estrogen deficiency, and the two major problems that we need to face is the climactic problems one and the fertility implications one. So I am, again, I'm sorry if I'm going to disappoint you, Dr. Rama and Sonia. I'm really not going to talk much on fertility because there's so much to talk about the climatic problems that I thought and so much on the basics 
the take home messages are very, very important. So I've kept it very, very simple. So I'm going to talk about the newer advances, the newer trends that we have when you talk about the nomenclature, when you look into the diagnosis, what are the sequelae and what is the management? So these are the questions that I have asked myself for this particular presentation. Now, premature ovarian insufficiency versus premature menopause. All of us know that this was referred to as different uh, forms like primary ovarian failure, premature fuller albrit. Uh, when he first termed this defect that he, he, he found that the primary defect was within the ovary. And then he named this primary ovarian insufficiency. So after years, we are just coming back to that terminology as premature, not the primary, but premature ovarian insufficiency. And there's a lot of thought which has gone into making this uh, terminology, which is very, very important, which all of us should start using from now, just like how we have now changed the terminology from HRT to MHT. This also needs to be changed because then it's easy understanding when we are talking about, and there are a lot of implications when you talk about premature ovarian insufficiency, because we know when we talk about premature menopause, which was pre which is pre uh, premature ovarian insufficiency, it is the defect in the ovary, the decrease in the follicles or a dysfunction of the follicles. But POI, remember, it is not the same as menopause at the expected age. So we cannot call it as premature menopause because when you say menopause after one year of amenorrhea, you wouldn't expect a pregnancy after that. You wouldn't expect an ovarian function to resume after that. And the implications of a natural menopause acting at a natural time is very, very, very different from a premature ovarian insufficiency occurring at a young in the prime of a woman's life. So ovarian function in premature ovarian insufficiency may spontaneously resume even after one year of amenorrhea and ovarian function will not resume after the expected menopause at an expected age. So premature actually here really refers to a timeline rather than the etiology. So we should remember that. So premature ovarian insufficiency is the term, new terminology and that is the recent advance. And the types of POI for us is very, very important to understand because when you're talking about primary, we used to always talk about primary amenorrhea. So instead of saying primary amenorrhea, we can just say type one or prepubertal premature ovarian insufficiency. When you're talking about type two or post-pubertal premature ovarian efficiency, this means the period stops spontaneously and then the ovarian failure has happened. And this is happening before the age of 38 years in India, before the expected natural age for natural menopause. So this is the natural POI. When you talk about the type three is the iatrogenic POI. So the uh, induced one that is chemotherapy or radiotherapy for cancers is absolutely understandable. Even those are understandable when it is done for risk reducing purposes. But those are the ones which are un unpardonable are the ones where surgical menopause with bilateral oophorectomy is done for benign reasons. And even those hysterectomies are probably done for not really a proper reason. So um, Madam, uh, like Dr. Balama said, this is one area which is something which can be prevented because as we go on, we know what are the implications of this POI. So there's a meta-analysis about the prevalence or global prevalence because earlier on that one percent was fixed in our mind poi one percent one to two percent world over but the meta-analysis of 2019 in 2019 in climatric they, they actually picked up more than 8900 uh, relevant articles and they actually cut it down to 31 with their inclusion criteria and what they found globally the prevalence of poi with the definitions that they had formed was 3.7 percent but then Early menopause is 12.2. And now there is a lot of talk saying that it is not just the POI, but early menopause also needs the same attention in terms of the sequelae as, as the POI. Maybe not for fertility, but at least for the other POI implications that, the, that a woman has to undergo. So the prevalence of uh, POI, another thing that came out of this study was that the prevalence of POI was much, much higher in the medium and the low economically uh, countries rather than the highly developed countries. And this prevalence actually did not change over time. That means they studied over a period of 30, 40 years. And this prevalence actually persisted over the period of all these years. Now, let's see what is, what is prevalence in India. Actually, it's much, much horrifying. Because what we find is the average, uh, the percentage with premature menopause 
by this NHS study, a population by study uh, in 2016, which was uh, actually uh, taken, this was taken, the data was taken from the NHS survey. And what they found is 5.5% of premature menopause, but this is not enough. More is prevalent between the ages of 39 and 40. So we have to be on the lookout for this age group whenever they come with those irregular cycles and those telltale signs, which I'm going to really talk about. This is where I'm going to really concentrate. So the prevalence in India when it comes to the NHS one is all India is 5%. But look at this in Andhra Pradesh, Actually, it is 14.6%, which is almost three times more compared to all other states. So this was really, really depressing to understand that we have, and I think we as obstetricians and gynecologists, our entire society has to really take this up as to why the hysterectomy rate is so high in India. In 2007, this was, uh, this was from 2007 where Kamishwari had presented that average age at which surgeries were done was 28.5. And I, I remember I had done uh, a talk on just ethics in surgery. And there, there was just before I had presented, there was a photograph saying that at uh, Nizambad in some uh, suburb area, all the women, all the Lombardi women didn't have any uteruses. So that was really, but that was long back. And, and I think the Foxy is doing a wonderful job. And there is a lot of change. And I'm sure the statistics probably would be slightly different from what it was. In my own practice, what I have noticed is out of 1,166, almost 100 women are suffering from, were suffering from POI. I don't know whether because it's a referral practice, but that is, a, that is quite a big number. Then why is that? Ovaries from Indian women, so there was this very nice comparative study. Of course, they didn't do it for POI, but they did it to compare the ovarian reserve in Spanish women and Indian women. So the authors were from India as well as from Spain. And what they, what they found was the ovaries from Indian women age six years earlier. So the ovarian reserve diminishes much earlier compared to the Spanish women. And why was it? So now the, now the question arises, okay, so now there is a lot of information tell us that we age earlier, but why is it? Is it genetics? Is it environment? Is it nutrition? Is it lifestyle factors such as smoking? Or the latent genital tuberculosis, which is widespread in India, is also thought to be a contributing factor. So look at these factors. When we look at these factors, don't you think that these are some things that can really be worked upon? Except for the genetics, all the rest can be worked upon to reduce that POI. Even the genetics, I'm sure it is partly the epigenetics where if the nutrition is well maintained, if the environment is good for that particular period, maybe the epigenetics also can be changed to a great extent. Thank you, Dr. Rama. I always use this slide and it is so wonderful when you talk about the age, aging process and why Indian women age earlier and how nutrition probably pays an effect. Now, when you take a biopsy, Dr. Sudha, Dr. Rama has taken from Dr. Sudha and she's a pathologist, but probably this was never published, but Dr. Rama shared these slides with me and I think this was some really wonderful work because biopsies taken from normal newborn ovary show all these lovely oocytes over there. But when it is taken from the IUGR babies, there is ballooning. There is ballooning, there is depletion of the ovarian follicles. So that means that we start off with a decreased number of follicles or follicles which are defective. And that is the reason we end up having an early menopause and uh, premature ovarian failure, which is much, much earlier. So do Indians age early? Does it start in utero? Again, I would like to thank here Dr. Tripura because this is one of the studies which she has done and, uh, and published where they found that induction of labor is better than conservative management up to 40 weeks of gestation uh, to decrease the maternal and perinatal morbidity and mortality because what we find is we the placenta ages much faster. So that means we start aging earlier in every aspect. It's not just, so it starts right from those oocytes, the time that, that uh, ovum is developed to the time that embryo is developed and so on and so forth. So aging and these aging, I think is mainly because of the oxidative stress. So we know that there's so much of inflammation, so much of oxidative stress, all of them probably have an act, but these are all, most of them are preventable, are avoidable. And that is the role where as doctors, as clinicians, we have a role. So you see, POI is not PO premature ovarian insufficiency. It is a spectrum. It is not a, a event. It is not menopause. 
it is a it is a spectrum just like menopause transition just like how menopause transition would take 3 to 4 years to get into menopause similarly this would also be will take that much of time so it's not an event it is not a final event and that is why you have this aberrations you have those uh, um, ovulations just like at menopause transition you have somebody even at the age of 40 45 and 50 coming up and saying very sheepishly that my pregnancy test is positive so similar things can happen much more can happen in this particular age so we need to understand this i'm sure all of you all know this very well um, uh, because we can start really diagnosing only when the antral follicles are seen on the ultrasound or when the fsh starts going up and the inhibit b goes down and the estradiol production goes low so this is where we are actually diagnosing but then the true ovarian reserve starts off much earlier but one thing is the amh production from the preantral follicles so there was a lot of excitement when this amh was was uh, uh, had come in you know about uh, 10 15 years ago but what we realized was the the data was really showing uh, good i mean it showed that it correlated well but then they could not predict menopause for a period of 5 years that means amh could start falling even before 5 years of menopause so that's not good enough to know when a particular woman would be going into menopause so that was the pitfall of that amh that we have been uh, doing uh, for the prediction of menopause of course it plays a very important role in the spectrum of poi probably we are going to have a scoring system soon so that is the newer trend the newer trend is a thought process to have a scoring system so that you can predict poi predict predicting menopause may be useful in certain situations but predicting poi is very important for each and every woman who is a suspect so there if you have a risk scoring chart then it would be much easier for a clinician to catch them at that particular time and then address issues at a very very early time so that the fertility issues can be solved and so many other issues also could be solved so the spectrum starts off when the clinical the way, uh, uh, by the time she is overtly poi the F which is elevated the fertility is re reduced the men, the periods are almost amenorrheic and the amh is of course very low but initially when the clinically the periods are regular and the fsh may be normal the fertility also may be normal the periods are regular and the amh may also be normal but only in the occult one that, that is where the amh starts falling so this could be the first indication where there is a reduced fertility and this should be a big red flag for us that we start you know monitoring these people more more uh, uh, regularly but then also the other end of the uh, talk is that we should not frighten them off because we, like we said it may take 5 years or 7 years before they can have their um, uh, menopause and then this particular amh is something like your serum estradiol it the, it's very labile and and then it is not very accurate so something new has come up that is called ultra sensitive amh which i'm going to talk about so the diagnostic criteria so now this entire talk of mine is basically on the type 2 now uh, that is the natural natural uh, ovarian failure with a little bit on the type type 3 so how will you diagnose a natural premature ovarian failure age is less than 40 years so we can actually consider in india less than 30 years oligomenorrhea that is again a red flag less than 3 months so more than 3 months a woman says i've not had my periods for more than 3 months or it has been just very spotting think about think about poi it need not necessarily always mean only a pco so in this group of women an elevated uh, tsh uh, fsh level more than 25 to 40 i have given a range because we'll come to it different organizations have got different criteria between 4 weeks apart so these are the ones which really confuse the clinician low estradiol levels usually less than 30 micrograms because many of these women may be asymptomatic except for the oligomenorrhea and some women may also be symptomatic and here you also definitely have to rule out all other causes of amenorrhea hyperprolactinemia thyroid you know these are the ones which are very very common so we need to rule out all these factors and oligomenorrhea may be the one which they present with and uh, uh, because the elevated fsh given by different organizations is different so we will also discuss why and how Uh, so here i'll just take a break and talk about this ultra sensitive amh because this was um, uh, released in 2020 where they have come out with another test which is ultra sensitive amh because they this is able to detect 
very low levels, that is even 1.85 picograms of ML compared with the 50 to 100 picogram with the current AMH techniques are available. So if we get a test which, which detects those minute levels, so then you know and you have that uh, um, a range for different age groups, then it is easier to detect, uh, easier to predict the premature menopause or even menopause within the next year or two. So the prediction rate would increase if the sensitivity of the image would uh, increase. So this is what we are really looking forward to. Now, the most commonly used diagnostic limit for menopause is 40 international units. The uh, NICE Institute says 30 international units, whereas the ESHRI, naturally, because they are more into the fertility, they say more than 25 done uh, four weeks apart than it is uh, UI. So it is important, though, that POI is not overdiagnosed because in, the, in those with regular cycles and no history of any relevant menstrual, menstrual disturbances. So it did not go to the other extreme and frighten women off saying that they're suffering from POI. So early menopause, the most important symptoms are irregularity of periods or no periods after stopping the contraceptive pill and inability to get pregnant, transient, intermittent, or no symptoms except for menstrual stopping. So these are the things that we need to remember, and these are the trends. These are the simple clinical trends which are really, really important for us to remember. Now, how do we establish the diagnosis? So any woman, so these, I, I think these are important clinical trends. The recent trends, the thought process has to change. That any woman less than 40, less than 40 years who comes with uh, within the three months of amenorrhea, always, always of course, do a pregnancy test. If that is negative, then do the first the TSH, the prolactin, then do the FSH and estradiol. If the TSH and FSH are normal, then next step that you need to do is the FSH and the uh, estradiol. Now, what are you going to do? Supposing an FSH and elevated estradiol, don't label this particular woman as uh, POI. Like Dr. Rama always says, this could be a mid-cycle gonadotrophin surge and that you're being fooled into thinking that it is a POI. So always look at the day that you have done it and perhaps go back and repeat it because in case of a POI, it would be an elevated FSH, but it has to be a low estradiol. Then again, don't go by one because the re reporting could be wrong. There could be a technical problem. Whatever reason, repeat it again. So two times, at least four weeks apart, then you can come to a diagnosis of primary ovarian insufficiency. So very, very important. Once you diagnose your POI, you have to go back and understand the etiology. So ultrasound becomes very, very important to understand the ovarian size, the ovarian volume, the antral follicular count, it definitely adds value. Then you have to also identify any autoimmune disorders. So you do a battery of tests over there to understand the secondary causes of uh, premature ovarian insufficiency. Then the second line where you're not doing it routinely, but karyotyping becomes very, very important. This is not only for her, but for the future generations uh, to understand what exactly is going wrong, whether it is a genetic problem. So karyotype and FMR pre-mutation analysis and lot is lot of work is being done in this particular area. So I think AMH becomes very important. The a second, the other uh, test that we need to do is to rule out complications. So the first thing that we need to do, we would be doing the metabolic profile for her. We would be doing the lipid profile for her, the, uh, the blood sugars, the HB1AC, and never forget to add in the DEXA. The DEXA becomes very important, not only for bone health, because we have found in our practice, women coming with long-standing POIs and who have not really born, gone into a good lifestyle, have not taken any treatment, the muscle strength also goes down much earlier. So that play a very important role in the quality of life. So rule out complications by doing all these tests. So these become a mandatory actually. These are the mandatory tests that need to be done for a woman with uh, POI. A, a little bit on POI and in pregnancy. So post-diagnosis, spontaneous pregnancy is seen in five to 14%. So here uh, I would like to update uh, uh, on the fertility aspect that most of the fertility newer techniques that have come in, whether it is stem cell or from the mesenchymal cells or from the adipose cells or the hemopoietic cells, all of them plus the IVA, most of them or the plasma rich platelet, whatever it is, most of them, the pregnancy rates have 
not gone beyond, uh, uh, not, not really gone beyond this particular range. So that is why they actually measure it with this gold standard to see the efficacy. So that is why it's not become commonplace. So we are still in that experimental. So all those are still in the experimental phase, though pregnancies have occurred, but then the spont but not much more than the spontaneous pregnancy rate, which would otherwise have happened in a POI. So right now we don't have a clinical test to, to see which particular women with a poor POI has the potential for conception or which particular newer treatments which are being offered is better than the other in improving the fertility women. And here I'm alluding to your DHA and to the, uh, the different regimes that you follow, whether you're suppressing the FSH and you're suppressing with the COCs or the MHT, and then you know the different regimes that you're using for fertility treatment. No treatment has really shown superiority as of now. Now, so I thought we would just, I would, you know, talk about two interesting cases that I had. And I always thank God for sending these two patients simultaneously in June uh, 2019, where both of them actually, this lady delivered and this lady was due for her delivery and both are cases of PUI. Informed consent was taken for me, for, from them. So they were happy, they were, and I think one of them, in fact, presented herself and presented her case at one of our meetings. So she gave this caption. God answers and miracles happen because they were the happy lot who had the spontaneous pregnancies. And uh, the case one was Anita who had delivered and who we are seeing, who was sitting there in the uh, ICU ward, uh, 49 years, married for 30 years, complained of excessive painless bleeding after seven months of amenorrhea. And she wanted to, she was very nervous because somebody where she went told her that this amount of bleeding you have to rule out endometrial cancer. And because periods have stopped suddenly and then they told her that you're going in for menopause. And so no medical problems. So you are now menopause, now you cannot conceive. And she had one miscarriage in the first year of her married life. That is 29 years ago. She had ART, laparoscopy twice, 10 IUIs, two IVIs and no success. And this is what we saw when we just, you know, we saw the abdomen and when we put the uh, ultrasound probe over there, the placental separation was happening. And she just came on that time. Just very quickly, we delivered her. The baby was uh, just about not even, uh, I think 1.5 kg. And, uh, and it was a happy ending. Of course, the baby needed to be in the incubator, but the baby is doing well and uh, fine. And, th and of course, we must thank our neonatologist for doing a wonderful job with the baby. Now, Bhagya Lakshmi is the second case who was standing, 37 years uh, on June 19th, and she was married for 14 years. She had one child, 13 years. She presented with this irregular cycles and high levels of FSH, and she was very symptomatic. And she was also hypothyroid. So we put her on hormone therapy because these were uh, FSH levels which kept increasing, her AMH was low, and the ultrasound kept showing low reserve. And uh, we, uh, of course, started with the lifestyle management, and we put her on the continuous sequential regime. She used to get regular withdrawal, and 19 February, she didn't have her period since December. So she thought, because we had told her, eventually, you may stop your periods while you're on therapy, and here we did make a big mistake. We didn't tell her that HRT is not a contraceptive. We didn't, we didn't, didn't really realize. And after this case, I realized that we have to be very, very clinically oriented. We have to inform our women that when we put them on HRT in the younger population, that that is not a contraceptive. But luckily for her, she wanted a pregnancy. And when we did the scan, she was 16 weeks pregnant. So that was a happy ending for both of them. But does age matter? for menopause? Yes, it does. Because late age at natural menopause has been associated with greater life expectancy, reduced all-cause mortality, reduced risk of cardiovascular disease, reduced risk of osteoporotic fractures. But there is a slight increase in endometrial cancer, slight increase in breast cancers uh, of the uh, receptor positive ones. So early age of menopause in India, this is a common slide which I've been using since so many years. Our uh, estimated age is 46, and this can predispose to a lot of chronic health problems. 10 to 20 years earlier, we the Indian fracture 10 to 20 years earlier compared to the Caucasians. Myocardial infarction also occurs much earlier. Type 2 diabetes occurs a decade earlier than Caucasian. So you see the multi-morbidity, all these chronic conditions happen earlier. Remember the, uh, Dr. Tripura's uh, presentation over there, even your placental uh, maturation occurs 14 days earlier compared to the Caucasians. So early age of menopause, chronic diseases, even in an Australian study, they found that yes, POI, 
more amount of multimorbidity association. So definitely age of menopause has an impact on the multimorbidity. And there is, of course, the social consequences of POI. The woman is uh, leads to a very disturbed married life. And if she has a lot of other problems, that makes her feel very negative approach towards the entire life and low life satisfaction. So the scores will be quality of life will be less. So you would agree with me when we say that POI is a pathological state, very different from menopause, and definitely it needs treatment. Mortality is 50% higher in women compared to natural menopause and the risk is much more in surgically induced. And then we will be coming to that. Uh, uh, I have a very interesting slide to show the difference between natural and uh, surgical menopause. And there are a lot of epidemiological studies which are supportive of an adverse effect of PRI on the sequelae of POI on the women's health. The Dutch cohort study, the Japan study, the Swan study, the nurses health study, all these longitudinal studies have shown that the life expectancy is reduced by two years. There is an increase in all-cause all mortality. And uh, the best documented series is from the Mayo Clinic where what happens after surgical menopause. The earlier one we were talking about, in those cohort we were talking about the natural POI. But what happens after now, oophorectomy from aging? And here is what happens, that is if the oophorectomy is in blue and these are the normal ones. So if the surgery is done less than 45 years, the survival chances are much lesser compared to if you are doing the bilateral oophorectomy after 45 years. Though after oophorectomy, the mortality does come down, but it is much more higher if it is done at a younger age. And similarly, the long-term effects, the hazard ratios, if you see the line one above one, or overall mortality is above one compared to uh, after 50 years, if somebody attains menopause, or if the oophorectomy is done after 50 years compared to if it is done below 50, 45 years. Here again, cognitive impairment, less than 43 years, the chances of impairment is almost close to three. The hazard ratio is almost three. Similar to Parkinsonism, the chances of getting Parkinsonism is much higher and cardiovascular mortality is also much higher when it is done less than 45 years compared to uh, oophorectomy done after the age of 50 years. I think that is a big take home message. Unnecessary hysterectomies, unnecessary oophorectomies should be avoided. Even the salpingectomy when is being done, but really we need to think twice even before putting those clamps on, this, uh, on, this, uh, on the tubes, whether we are compromising the blood supply and making a woman go into early menopause. So I think now tubectomy has to be a thing of the past. We have to really move in more and more into the reversible contraception. Because again, you see natural versus surgical morbidity. This is a beautiful uh, clinical characteristics of women with POI where they have done a model. And what they found is this is a natural menopause above this line. And this is a timeline in years. That is from the age of 20, 10 to 55. And this shows surgical premature menopause. So if a woman has her menopause, say around 35, what happens if the bilateral oophorectomy has done? What happens in natural menopause? Natural menopause, the first thing probably, there may be more amount of allergic factors. This is what the, the study has shown. But the, the other uh, sequelae of POI actually generally happen after 45. That means along with the process of aging. And probably these can be controlled to some extent, even without the hormones, if they are other cofactors of these chronic disorders, if they are being met with, then lifestyle modification being one or statins and so many other things. So this can probably prevent it to a great extent. But look what happens. There is a cluster of all these comorbidities around the age of 40, 43 to 55 uh, to less than 50, actually 45 to 50. If, you're, if a woman undergoes bilateral oophorectomy at the age of 35. So the chances of all these problems happening are much, much higher and probably a lone lifestyle may not help. And here where the role of hormone therapy plays a very important role in the same Mayo Clinic cohort study where bilateral oophorectomy was done. In blue, if the woman is not treated, the chances of survival are much uh, um, lower compared to the woman where the uh, uh, MHD has been given after oophorectomy. 
so in a woman with meta uh, so there have been some meta analysis and in a uh, so this is the, not only the cardiovascular and the all cause mortality this was what they have found in turner syndrome when they when it, uh, women uh, in a rct of 17 women with turner syndrome when they were supplemented with even the ocps they found that it corrected the hyperinsulinemia so we we really don't have enough of data enough of randomized trials enough of longitudinal studies on the effect of this poi and all these comorbid conditions so i think there is lot of talk going on lot of registries have been set up lot of work is being done in poi and we are going to get more information probably in the next 5 to 10 years so there is no long term data exists on cardiovascular outcomes in young women with poi treated with the use of hrt but we can extrapolate the data from older naturally occurring population and definitely we know the effect we know the effect of the lack of estrogens there is enough proof in vivo in vitro so i think by giving the hrt definitely improves the outcomes for cardiovascular system similarly in bone health there were two excellent studies one again with turner syndromes and one with idiopathic poi because turner syndrome is something which has been there and where hormone therapy is always been offered so i think we have more information there and the results on the on the multimorbid conditions so they have found that definitely Uh, uh giving the hormone therapy hormone replacement therapy in these women increases the cortical and the trabecular bone in both these uh, uh, conditions but here again there is a a catch the catch is when you are doing the dexa for a poi how will you diagnose this osteoporosis cardiovascular of course you have you know how you're going to diagnose by the lipid profiles by the other uh, test that we have for the cardiovascular system but for the dexa we generally use in the post menopausal we are using the t scores whereas in the uh, the iscd and the iof foundation they have said that if you are doing the dexa in a pre menopausal women then you are not going to use the t scores you are going to use the z scores z scores are referring to bone density to the standard deviation below the age adjusted mean you are not you are not doing the bone uh, density uh, below, uh, compared to the young adult mean you are doing the age appropriate so the z score course less than minus 2 means that woman is suffering from low bone mass or osteoporosis but world health organization has said that you can use the t score that is less than 2.5 if a woman has attained a, a peak bone mass and you are doing in that particular age group between the peak bone mass and the menopause even then you can use it so the white paper which uh, the international menopause society is a good read for a poi and there they said the diagnosis can be done of osteoporosis in these pre menopausal women in the presence of fragility fractures especially vertebral fractures and z score less than minus 2 or t score more than minus 2.5 so as i was preparing for this this lady came in who was um, uh, uh, 33 years old she got she um, was diagnosed as poi at 33 years but unfortunately she was not offered any treatment and she really didn't have much information on uh, uh, on the poi and what it can do to her but she was miserable throughout but she has been just going and taking some uh, lifestyle management and some treatment uh, non hormonal treatment and when we did her baseline study and uh, but she was well maintained she uh, she was uh, uh, normal bmi but when we did her bo bone health what we found is a t score and z score both showed osteoporosis at the age of 37 uh, and her uh, muscle strength was also low so the these are the findings and this we wouldn't know and she would probably go on like that because she actually came with a referral saying she had a lot of bone pains so the first line of therapy in these kind of women would be estrogen replacement only if estrogen is contraindicated then probably raloxifene is better bezidoxafen is not available that would be the second choice and bisphosphonates would be the last choice in these kind of women yeah, of course teriparatide and dilucebam is only in severe osteoporosis and coming to breast cancer you know whenever you're offering hormone therapy the scare is when we are giving oral contraceptives or when we are giving hormone therapy for such a long time what will happen but if you are giving those doses to women who are at not at a high risk of breast cancer because you are going to sort out you are going to do the risk assessment then i don't think we need to worry and we have some data to say that the risk of breast cancer with long term hd use uh, in poi is not thought to be any higher than that of the age matched non poi population this is from this particular 
uh, uh, studies from the Turner syndrome. Of course, all of us know that women with POI would have lesser incidence of breast cancer compared to the people who attain menopause at a later age group. Uh, but don't, and we should never, never forget the psychological impact of premature ovarian insufficiency. I think this itself could become a talk on its own. So the management would be divided into four areas. One is the genetic health, because here we want to know the cause. And the emotional health, never, never forget, never drop this diagnosis just like that and walk away. She will need a lot of counseling, a lot of talking, and a lot of assurance. And then we have to work along with her over a period of time and also tell her that it is a long journey and she will have to probably keep seeing you again and again over a period of time, and then maybe once a year. Then a full, if she needs reproductive health options, then of course, all these things come in where you know all these newer versions are also coming in but endocrine health is what we are looking at that is full replacement therapy so when we talk about endocrine health i would also talk about this ovarian transplant which has come in big way and have, have been very good responses with the laparoscopy coming in the surgeries also have become very very easy and they're also looking at different areas of transplant and not definitely a more in less invasive ones and not the entire ovary even a probably a slices of them and uh, but they have been all done only for fertility but then people we have not yet worked and nor are being promoted for the endocrine health. But if a stage comes in where this ovarian transplant is being done for endocrine health, probably that is the time when people would do away with the hard work therapy. If somebody can do a subdermal imp implant of a donor ovum without that uh, donor uh, ovarian cortex, without the um, immunosuppression and all the other drugs that are uh, um, involved in doing that, then probably the uh, MHT will, uh, uh, HRT will not be needed and never will never forget the lifestyle modification and of course i will never forget now to talk about contraception in these pois where uh, when they come to us so the management in a pre-pubertal is to induce development of secondary sexual characteristics and development and for the others in the secondary ones in uh, type 2 is the, uh, relieve the immediate sequelae so even asymptomatic women we are going to treat it's not really the symptoms but we are going to treat the asymptomatic women and then of course also help in fertility so all guidelines agree that hormone therapy should be given but then none of the guidelines really talk about screen screening, monitoring, and there is no consensus regarding what is the ideal hormone replacement therapy? What is the ideal dose for these women? Because we don't have enough data to base those guidelines on. But then compared to when you compare MHT, uh, MHT at menopause and HRT in POI, there are two differences, two glaring differences. Vasomotor, both yes. Genitourinary, both yes. Bone health, this becomes the first line of management compared to where people are very, very skeptical in severe osteoporosis to give hormone therapy, even in the perimenopausal or early menopause transition. But here, this is an indication. This is the first line of management. Similarly, yes, cardiovascular prevention, this forms very important. Sexual function, libido, again, this forms very important. For sexual function, then we are not going to give the oral. You're probably planning, uh, prefer to give the uh, decreased uh, libido. You would go for transdermal because we don't have the testosterone. So the kind of uh, MHT that you're going to give, the uh, OCPs, the, whether you're going to give short term, whether you're going to long term, these are the questions. But the ideal dose would be to attain a physiological level of 100 micrograms 17 beta estradiol is what is important because it has to be 100 micrograms per ml, that is the mid follicular levels. So that would be enough to keep all the tissues well furnished with this estradiol at the receptor levels and keep all the tissues ticking and active and young. So that is the level of estradiol that you would need. And uh, <clears throat> women with POI with special issues, I'm not really not going to talk about this because these are the same indications, contraindications that you would find with the uh, MHT. So the adverse effects are also the same, but here uh, um, uh, the, the, the risk of breast cancer was uh, is a little different. Only it was increased in women aged more than 50 years, but they did not, the Dutch uh, Danish uh, Cancer Registry, they did not find an increase in breast cancer, even with 
hormone replacement therapy, that is the estrogen progesterone combination, also didn't increase uh, the rate of breast cancer when, when it was offered to women less than 50 years. BRCA1, BRCA2 carriers, after the risk reducing bilateral salpingo ophorectomy, they found no increased risk of breast cancer. So these women can be offered hormone therapy. And of course, we should never be uh, giving only estrogen, always uh, along with the progesterone. VT is, is, is there as at any given age group. So symptomatic women start with standard dose or high dose. Asymptomatic women, low effective dose. But the average is 50 to 100 picograms per ml is the estradiol levels that you would want. So there are no control studies to understand which is the high deal hormone replacement strategy. When you compare the combined OCPs with HD, the earlier studies, these two earlier studies have shown that physiological doses of estrogen and progesterone actually work better than the uh, OCPs, uh, that is oral contraceptive pills, whether for cardiovascular health or for the bone. But there is a very interesting study which has come in from Brazil. And what they have found is they compared the lower doses of estrogen therapy in the younger population, that is less than 35 years. And what they have found, the contraceptive pill actually works better in that age group, probably because that is the age where the estrogen requirement is much more. So the natural estrogen being low potency may not raise the trabecular bone or the cortical bone as well as uh, the trabecular bone, especially as well as the uh, COCs. So the pros and cons are it is convenient, it's peer friendly, it is free, and we have a government supply. Whereas uh, it, it is unphysiological is what uh, the diehard HRT fans will say, but and pill free week can lead to symptom resurgence because that one week if you're not giving, so you have to give a continuous dose. So the simple answer for this pill free week is don't stop. Just like how we give for endometriosis, give continuously the COPs. Annual follow-up is very, very important. And then if a woman cannot or does not wish to take hormone therapy, there are, of course, the other uh, non-hormonal therapies which are available. Now comes the mood question. Is this preventable? And like I've already said in prevalence, yes. And I think we can do a lot. And I feel this is the most important recent trend that our understanding that we have in POI change your gynec practice. Don't do unnecessary surgeries. For AUBs, there are so many options available for all those uh, so all those indications where we used to do the surgeries, we can go for medical, uh, medical management. Lifestyle, smoking has definitely been shown to cause a deleterious effect. So any of those environmental toxins which cause a deleterious effects on the, um, on the uh, um, follicle, so just like your uh, even endometriosis. So all of them, can be tackled so that these women don't enter into POI earlier and modified regimes for malignant and chronic conditions is what needs to be looked at and genetic counseling plays a very very important role this is also for the future generation so these this is how you could really tackle uh, uh, at, at working at a larger picture uh, to prevent POI in India and some of the questions that you can ask is this probably would fall into the risk factor scoring system in the history that early men are that is periods that start at 11 years or earlier. Family history, risk increase up to 12 times. Smoking, history of epilepsy, history of any surgery on the ovaries. These are all the risk factors for POI. So this becomes, you know, when all of them come there, that gives you a green, uh, that gives you a red flag. This history is there, plus she has three months of amenorrhea. Think of all the investigations that you need to do. Delay, but there, there was this interesting study in 2002, but I'm sure this does not change much. Many women experience a significant delay in diagnosis after the end sort, uh, onset of disordered menstrual pattern. That means the diagnosis can be delayed as long as three to five years in 25% in of the women for POI. That means we need to be more and more alert. So the tips to diagnose early is young women who experience menstrual irregularity Always remember TSH, prolactin, both normal, do an FSH and estradiol. So that is, again, a recent trend. That means we have to look at that. Now, the most important is the POI registry, which, I'm, which I feel we IMS uh, should be starting in collaboration uh, with the fertility societies that we have in India, because I think most of the women go there because they need, they, I think the input there as a, for the POI is much more than women who are coming to us for hormone therapy. So in collaboration, we should be starting a uh, registry because then we get our own 
data. Then we get a better understanding as to why it is happening. Then we get an, a better understanding is what we can offer. What are the chronic morbid states that, that this woman are undergoing? What are the fertility issues? What are the treatments we can offer them? I think we can get a lot of information by the data collection through this POI registry. So the practice of medicine is an art, not a trade, a calling, not a business. A calling in which your heart will be exercised equally with your head. Well said uh, uh, by Osler. And I thank you so much for this patient hearing. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ambuja. Thank you so much, all my IMS, Dr. Rama, Dr. Balama, for being here. Uh, I'm really overwhelmed. <laughs>